thank you very much for uh, inviting me to come in and talk a little bit about some of the previous work we're doing and a little bit about what we're doing at the moment. We've got some very interesting projects that I'm very excited about. Um, but before we get going, I, I thought it'd be a good idea to have a little bit of background, to talk a little bit about what we're really dealing with. You know, this is a pretty fundamental question, but what are we talking about here? I mean, what is cancer? Now, the definition that you're going to get to if you read out of a textbook is that it is an uh, uncontrolled proliferation, that certain cells within a population just grow so much quicker and they grow out of control. And that's true, but it's a bit of kind of an, uh, a dry kind of academic definition, and it really doesn't get to the, the meat of the material, that fundamentally, if you think of it, it is a breakdown of a, uh, an agreement. It's a breakdown of kind of a molecular pact that was made uh, billions of years ago. And we, we are multicellular organisms. We're comprised of a large number of cells that have to come together and work as a team. So we are comprised of 10 to the 13th individual cells in each of us. Now these 10 to the 13th cells have to work together. Because of mutations that arise through uh, errors in DNA replication or because of a carcinogen or because of UV light, whatever it may be, certain mutations can happen to the individual cells. And when these mutations happen, the arrangement, the agreement that was developed before many billions of years ago can break down. And no longer does the cell begin to look out for uh, the organism as a whole, it begins to look out for itself. And you have a bit of a cellular revolution going on in your hands, whereby the individual cell is no longer concerned about the good of the multicellular organism, but only about the good of the individual. But if the cancer, or if the kind of revolutionary cell, acquires additional mutations that allow it to get over these safeguards, then the cancer can begin to proliferate unimpeded. If the cancer can resist cell death, it if it can invade the uh, growth suppressors, if it can sustain prol or proliferation, if it can spread, and above all, if it can become immortal. It's only the individual cell that is important to proliferate. And they proliferate like you wouldn't believe. A very famous example is this woman right here, from Henry or Henrietta Lacks is her name. Uh, she was from Baltimore, and unfortunately, she uh, had a very severe form of cervical cancer uh, that killed her in 1951. But before she died, her doctors, the clinicians, took out a small sample uh, of the uh, cancerous material and plated it out onto a petri dish, grew it in an in vitro environment. So here's a remarkable thing. This woman died in 1951 from the cancer, yet the cells to this day are still growing throughout the world in thousands of laboratories through the world. I have these growing downstairs. So she's been gone from this earth for 60 years, but her cancer cells are still growing extremely uh, prolifically. And this immortality, to be honest, presents a bit of a challenge because uh, these cells are very difficult to treat because they come from the same origin. To develop a drug to treat cancer is like uh, finding a small molecule that can affect your left ear but not your right ear. That's the kind of specificity you have because a cancer cell has many of the same characteristics as a normal cell, and you really do have to worry about uh, toxicology issues associated with it. So our laboratory specifically uh, is interested in treating prostate cancer. Prostate cancer affects one out of every seven Turkish and European men uh, in their lifetime. Now, prostate cancer is very unique in that it is a hormonally driven disease and that the proliferation of the cancer is entirely dependent on these chemical signals called androgen and they include testosterone and dihydrotestosterone the androgen is a signal to proliferate, and it holds on to this, to be honest. So once it becomes cancerous and it or, uh, begins to acquire these mutations, the cancer is still entirely dependent on androgens. And if you can block these androgens, you can block the progression of the cancer. So this is the one take-home message. This is the one thing I want you in the audience to remember when you leave, and I tell this to everybody, is that the androgen receptor is the best validated therapeutic target against late-stage prostate cancer. If you can stop the androgen receptor, you can slow the progression of the disease dramatically. And we found some very interesting molecules. One that we were particularly kind of enthusiastic about is this 13127. Now this molecule is totally different than what's commercially available. And here's the really important part. Because this drug works through a different mechanism of action, it doesn't have the same resistance profile that conventional antiandrogens do. So if we take a cell line that is intrinsically resistant to Medivation 3100, which is a very kind of new antiandrogen, if we take this cell line and we treat it with Medivation 3100, like we'd expect, at increasing concentrations, nothing happens. The cell line is intrinsically resistant to and or the antiandrogen. However, if we take our drug, which has a different mechanism of action, 
which binds to a different site on the androgen receptor, we find that it's very efficacious, that it can block the androgen receptor activity and slow the progression of this cancer. So we're trying to figure out what causes this cancer to become um, more aggressive and a little bit more androgen independent. And I'd like to thank all the different people who are involved in this work, as well as some of the funding sources uh, in this project. Thank you.